Thanks, Chris. There's a uh, phrase I used to say a lot back in the day. Whenever I ran to someone, I would say, how is every, every little thing? You know, when it comes to the place of prayer, God cares about every little thing. You know, you and I, if we are believers in Christ, we have a relationship that we are cultivating with the King of Kings. I've shared this countless times where you say that prayer of salvation and you invite Christ into your life as Lord and Savior. It's an introduction. Yes, you are 100% going to heaven. Yes, he now looks upon you as if you had never sinned. Yes, you are adopted into the family of God. Yes, you are a child of a king. Yes, to all of that. But you just met him. What do you know about him? Every, la uh, every Labor Day weekend is my spiritual birthday. It was the weekend that I went to church and came to Christ and moved into my frat house on campus. And uh, I, think about the, I, I think about the 400 liquor bottles that we had in our frat house apartment. And that... Uh, I'm sharing with my roommate about my new relationship with Christ and we are mixing black Russians and drinking black Russians and talking about Jesus stuff until one of my fellow frat house brothers who was a very strong believer in Christ who was into the navigators, you know, memorizing scripture, came in and saw the Bible and saw the bottle and said, there's something wrong with this picture, what is going on here? And I said, I got saved today. first six weeks of knowing Christ, I still thought Job was Job. I didn't know any better. What did I know? I didn't know any of his promises. I didn't know any of the benefits of knowing Christ. I was this newbie. I was a probie. You know, I was, you know, I was, I was, I was a probie waiting to be gift slapped by my, my mentors, you know. I mean, I was at that delicate phase of my Christianity. I had grown up at church, but really I had known nothing because I didn't know the Savior. Or there's a principle, there's a promise. We're going to look at it today about prayer. And the title is very simple, The Power of Persistent Prayer. I'm going to go through some very basic things about prayer. And then I'm going to share a whole bunch of answered prayers that in the 40... I got saved in September 1977. Somebody do the math. Is that 45 years? Yeah. 45 years. I have 45 years of answers. I'm also fortunate enough to be married to a woman who keeps a journal. Uh, you are correct. I know, because I was born in 76. What is it? 44. 44, okay. I don't want to get ahead of God. You know, 44. I still, I've lived some experiences. I've prayed some prayers. I have answers. Here's the thing I know. He will hear your cry. There's power in the persistence of prayer. Turn to Luke 18 if you have your Bible. Let's start in verse 1. This is not where you're going to expect me to start in prayer, but you need to hear this. Verse 1, Jesus told the disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. Do you hear that? We should always pray and not give up. What is the temptation of every single believer in the room? Never pray and always give up. Never pray and always give up. You win a Cupid doll if I had one. Very, very good. That's better than the one I had. We give up. We walk away. Oh, it's too hard. Oh, he must have not heard me. Oh, dear. Oh, me. You know? 
reminds me of the uh, character. If you remember, if you're old enough, to re show show of hands if you remember Chili Willy and Woody Woodpecker. That that okay? Do you remember? Uh, uh, I call I used to call him Sloopy Dog. The 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 the, the, the what what Droopy? Droopy, yes, Droopy Dog. Oh dear, oh me. Most Christians live that Droopy Dog experience. Oh dear. I'm a victim waiting to happen. <laughs> Look at this thing. Verse 2. He said, In a certain town there was a judge who, was neither feared, who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And you know any politicians and judges like that? They don't fear God. They don't care what people think. And there was a widow in a town who kept coming to him with the plea, Grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet this widow keeps bothering me. One scripture translation says, troubling me. I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. <laughs> There's an attitude a fervency a fire in the belly, so to speak, that you and I need in our Christian experience when it comes to the place of prayer. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust said. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? If Christianity in America was a Garth Brooks song, it would be we're looking for justice in all the wrong places. God says, will there be any faith left when I return? Now, we know it's intimate. We know that the, the word says that just about it looks like everything that could be done for his return to happen has already happened. We see the rumors and the signs and the, the seasons and the things going on in the world, which Revelation talks about, the end times. Hey, they're upon us. But do we pray and mean it? Are we persistent in our prayers? In Psalm 66, 17 through 20, it says, I cried out to him with my mouth. His praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But, the, but God has surely listened and has heard my prayer. Praise be to God who has not rejected my prayer or withheld his love from me. In 1 Peter 3, it says this, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So another passage that says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro, looking for someone who we can stand strong on behalf. God hears the cry of the righteous. If you... Okay. We are not some superhumans. We are not bigots. We are not uh, better off than anybody else. We're just saved by the grace of God. Amen? Mm -hmm. That we, as believers in Christ, as the scripture teaches the word zo sozo, just as if you've never sinned. That's how he looks upon you. Yes, you still sin. Yes, you're still messed up. Yes, you're in this progressive healing and progressive development of your discipleship where you're learning and you're growing and you're learning to put off the old man and putting on the new man. You're growing in grace. But that doesn't mean that God doesn't see you as you already are in his sight. Perfect. You're his child. He hears your cry. He promises to his Christ follower, followers that he hears our prayer, that he is committed to you. Do you hear that? God is committed to his children. In 1 John 5, it talks about we should have confidence 
because he hears us. And the Bible says this, and now this is the confidence that we have in him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we will have the petitions that we have asked him. God hears you. God desires to answer you. But unfortunately, in most of American Christianity, this is where the wheels fall off the bus. But you see, there's a caveat. And it's, it's found in that passage. It says, if we ask anything according to his will. Not your will. Not your hope so. Not your plans for your life. But his plans. If you're in... Best stand up and stretch for this. Too many of us watch Christian TV. Mm -hmm. Just as you should turn off the news. I, I rarely watch the news. It's depressing. I don't watch a whole lot of Christian TV. Why? God's not a rabbit's foot. You know? He's not this lucky rabbit's foot that... You know, you rub three times and you get three wishes, you know? Dave Baldwin, who was um, one of my mentors, when I was in college, uh, I was working under him as an uh, intern in Christian counseling. David was a prop counselor. His office had everything from a cowboy saddle to rodeo rope to a big stuffed gorilla to some of the coolest antique furniture I've ever seen. You know, he had a couple of big old chests with props that he would use when he would for illustrations and helping people for healing and working through things. <laughs> he had this gorilla. I mean, this is a big old gorilla, you know? And he would he would put it on his lap and he put put its two hands, the head paws, and would put the two paws together. He said, Chuck, Charlie, this is how the average church person prays in America. Oh Lord, gimme, 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 and thank you so much for healing Aunt Sadie's toe. When I first came to Garden City, this was originally Garden City Chapel for, gosh, almost 60 some years. When I first came, prayer meetings were a trip. There's me, my wife, Gordon, Dawn when she could be here from work. And the rest of the room, nobody was under the age of 80. Mm -hmm. And there were like 20 of them. And God bless them, some of them were retired missionaries. They were some of the sweetest people I ever, they loved Jesus, they gave to missions, they were passionate, they cared, but a few of them, would come to prayer meeting, pray about what they saw on Fox News that afternoon during dinner. Well, this is going in the world, on in the world, and and politically, this 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 thing, you know. Listen, as believers, we need to understand to how to biblically cultivate our relationship with God, and it begins with understanding His will. Not what we see in the world, not what we experience in the world, not what we think about who we are, not about our past sin, not about our current sin. It is about what did his word say. And that's where it starts. The first thing that we have to, to have a, a properly cultivated relationship with Christ is that we have to be purposely driven. We must become students of the word. If you are not in the word of God, reading the word of God, digesting the Word of God, memorizing the Word of God, hiding it in your heart, how in the world can the psalmist say, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path? It only, you only have light in your path and guided by the Spirit of God when you understand who He is, His benefits, His call, His purpose, His plans. When you understand those things, you've got to get to the place where you're digging deeper in the Word of God. When we peer closely and carefully into his word 
asking the Spirit for a receptive heart, he opens our eyes to behold wonderful things. In Psalm 119, 18. As you seek him in the pages of his word, we believe that your study will yield an abundant life. He's going to hear your prayer in relationship to his will. And if you understand his will, if you understand his promises, if you understand the benefits of knowing Christ, if you understand, here's the big one. We are, in a, we are saved into a kingdom that is within a kingdom. There's a kingdom all around us. But there's an invisible kingdom. His kingdom doesn't operate the same way as the world operates. We have to understand how he operates. Because we are now aliens and foreigners in this present world. We are saved out of this world. The rules of the world don't necessarily apply to us anymore. It does, but it doesn't. You follow what I'm saying? It's about his will, his purpose. And you and I have to become purposely driven by who he is. Second thing. We need to be passionate about him. We need to desire his kingdom, his plan. When his vision is our priority, then and only then will we fully comprehend his plan for our lives. Chris and I were talking about that today. Um, I've been unpacking some areas of ministry and as God's been showing me some things. This week, Fred's not in the room, he's upstairs. Fred said something to me this week. We were fellowshipping and we were talking about recovery programs. And, and Fred said this amazing thing. He said, you know, it's all about a network. God's kingdom is about a network. It's not about a church. It's about expanding his kingdom. For we serve an audience of one, the king of kings. And when you understand the fact that we are called as believers in Christ through our households and through our corporate participation to expand his kingdom. And that requires a network, where what we do is called to bless everybody. We are called to bless other churches. We are called to bless other believers, even though they aren't in our fellowship. We're called to edify and encourage and build them up. And when we are passionate about his stuff, you know what happens? In my prayer life, I've proven this. When we are passionate about his stuff, you know what happens? God comes around and behind you and takes care of your stuff. You don't even have to ask for it sometimes. Daddy, there's a phrase that I learned as a young Christian. Daddy, take care of you. Your father in, ke in heaven knows the number of hairs on your head. Some of you should be concerned about that <laughs> because he's keeping tabs. He cares about what sparrows eat. He cares about the little details. He cares about every little thing. And when we are passionate about his stuff, you know, I'm, I've been pleasantly surprised that he does care about my stuff because I care about his stuff. There's that reciprocation going on. It's not that if I didn't do his stuff, he wouldn't care about me. But the fact is that how his kingdom works is when we are passionate doing what he has called us to do, he takes care of some of the monotonous stuff. We don't have to worry. Third thing. We're called to position ourselves. This is not an endorsement of Duncan. This is where I happened to get my cup of tea this morning. Although, I will say this about the Dunkin' Donuts at Brookhaven in the drive-thru. The early morning crew are quite attentive. I pull up at 5.30 in the morning, and the lady goes, You're usual? <laughs> And I pull around, and it's there. Exactly what I always want. She knows me. She just knows me. She's a sweet lady. End of the commercial. Mm -hmm. Position yourself. 1 Peter 5, 6 says this. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that in proper time he may exalt you. Ooh. That is not the American way. The American way is... He who dies with the most toy wins. <laughs> I've seen people with desks like that. They have a big fancy desk. They have all this cool stuff in the room. Um, Drew Cope, who's a good friend of mine, we were talking on Facebook this morning, and he shared this 
most profound fact. We were talking about fear and trying to comfort people in fear through this COVID thing. He said, you know, Chuck, in 2250, every single person on the planet that's alive now will be dead. In 2250, all of us will be dead. Now, isn't that comforting? <laughs> it's humbling. The Bible says in James, our life is a vapor. Poof. You know, look at a tea kettle. You know, I'm a tea drinker. Look at a tea kettle. It's blowing this little steam out. That little vapor, it just quickly dissipates. You know, I've been doing this for a long time. I've been saved 44 years. That's a lifetime. I remember when I didn't need a cane and I actually ran track. Mm -hmm. Yes, I ran the third leg of the 440, you Olympians. I was the slowest guy on the team, but I was a baseball catcher and I had sure hands. And the key that we were having in junior high was a very simple thing. The guys were dropping the baton. We were the fastest team out there, but we kept dropping the baton. So the coach, Coach Pulaski, had this brilliant moment. Make the fat kid who can't, who has sticky fingers, who doesn't drop anything, run the third link. Get it to Bruce. That's, that was the whole thing. My job is, Chuck, I don't care what you run. Just get it to Bruce. And that was my job. I, ran, I was exhausted. I wanted to throw up. I was wiped out. It was humbling. I was horrible. It was, like, it was like, what is wrong with this picture? These three incredibly talented, gifted, good-looking athletes of the chubby kid with pimples. You know? It's me and junior high. It's humbling. It's humbling yourself under his hand. It's knowing that he's God. You know, um, Brian Musser has this saying that he gets these new students in, on campus and they come from all the different parts of the world. And he said, the first com conversation we have, there is God. Let me tell you which one it is. Same thing with Paul. Paul in, in, in the book of Acts. He's on Mars Hill and there's all these statues to all these gods and there's one God, one statue to the unknown God. And Paul's walking around, and he's got a little bit of an entourage, and people are following him around. He says, oh, I, I know about all these gods, but see that one there, the unknown one? I know who he is. Let me tell you about Jehovah. Let me tell you about Yahweh. Let me tell you about Jesus. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise, Psalm 51. In Jeremiah 33, it says, Call to me and I will answer you. Show you great and mighty things for which you do not know. When we understand his will, we understand these three points and have applied them practically to our life, we will mature as believers in Christ. There will be a dynamic at work in our lives that he will hear your prayers. He will give you justice. In some cases, he will answer quickly. Brings us back to persistence. The effectual prayers of a righteous man avails much. That's not what the verse actually says. It says the fervent, the effect, the fervent, effectual prayers of a righteous man avails much. Fervent. Fire. Fire from heaven. Fire from our knees. The battle, the warfare that you and I battle on a daily basis to see the kingdom come, to pray that Lord's Prayer, to pray that, Lord, may your kingdom come. It happens on our knees. You see, some prayers are not answered immediately. Some prayers are not answered without fasting. We pray without ceasing, the scripture says. Um, Tori Martin is a dear friend. He's a comedian. He's a writer. Uh, Adventures in Odyssey, if you're an uh, Adventures in Odyssey fan, he's one of the writers for Adventures in Odyssey. Um, he's an Alaskan who lives in Nashville. <laughs> Just take, imagine a guy who was living in the mountains of Alaska with the long red hair and the big Grizzly Adams beard, now living in civilization, okay? Um, if you've seen the movie Up, everybody seen the movie Up? 
Doug, squirrel. That's my buddy Tori. When you're hanging out with him, I've done this in a restaurant with him. I've been, on, I've been at a, at a uh, retreat with him. I've, he's been in our church. This is, this is the attitude that he has about prayer. I would love that every single one of you would do this, okay? You're talking about some, something. You're talking about a situation. You have a burden for it. And right then and there, immediately, you stop and you start praying. We were at the dinner table and we were talking about something. And he does this squirrel. He goes, oh, we got to pray about that. Father, it just... It's, just starts praying out loud. He lives that way. There's, there's this simplicity about his, his prayer life that I have fallen in love with. I say, God, please give me the courage to be, it is a pride thing, you know. We all have pride. We don't want that. Do we really want to humble ourselves in public? Do we really want really to do stupid things like, oh, excuse me, let's pray about that right now, out loud. I mean, you know, do we really do those kind of things? Well, yeah. People that really take the fervency part of it seriously pray like that. In Matthew 7, it talks about... By the way, I can't see the clock because of the glare. It is 11.25? Thank you. Yeah. Um, Matthew 7.7, 7, it says this. Ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. You and I not only need fervor, but we need to be part pit bull. We need to latch on to these things. You and I need to, as, as the scripture says, ask and keep on asking. Pray and keep on praying. Knock and keep on knocking. There's a persistence there. Literally in, in the Greek, that it talks about how that we are, we are to this keep on keeping on in our prayer life. Our prayers are not always answered quickly, efficiently. We have to be diligent. We have to have fervor. We have to have a persistence. You can't let it go. You cannot quit. You must press in. Story in the Old Testament. I didn't have time to look it up, but I know the, the gist of the story. Somebody was praying for an answer. And the angel finally showed up with the answer. And the angel says, good that you prayed. Because the enemy didn't want that prayer answered. And he sent his own demon to wrestle with me to keep me from bringing the answer to the world. There's a spiritual world that we cannot see. I said we are saved into a kingdom that's within a kingdom. There is a battle that is raging around us and our prayers matter. Your persistence matters. Here's your cry. I want to give you some examples. This is just encouraging. Some of it's from our church. Some of it's from my life, my wife's life. Some of it's from past church experiences and ministries. But some areas that we all wander into. And I want you to know that God did answer a prayer in that area. First one is a real simple one. I got saved in college. Now, I had what you would call stupid childlike faith. I was in that, well, he said it must be true, so I'm going to act upon it. I drove some people nuts. Well, first week I was saved, those of us who really know me back in the day, I was a coffeeholic. I'm a workaholic and I'm a coffeeholic. There was a time in my life that I never had an empty coffee mug. You know, three pots a day. No wonder my stomach lining is screwed up. But I'm just saying that I was into caffeine. <laughs> and in college, I was pulling, you know, 13 classes, 26 credits. I was a music student. We had a lot of half-credit courses that were required. So sleep was optional. So coffee was important. And I was a new Christian. My percolator died. 
I hadn't the money to go buy Mr. Coffee. It was They were all brand new. I didn't have one. I had the old-fashioned percolator that my grandmama gave me when I went off to college. It died. So I had a missionary who was home on furlough, who was my discipler, who would get together with me and do a Bible study. With, and uh, he called me. He said, so what can we be praying about? I said, well, to be honest with you, yesterday my coffee pot died. He goes, oh my. That's a tragedy. That, that's, that's an urgent prayer for a guy like you. I said, yeah. And we just prayed about it over the phone. Do you know in the next 48 hours, five brand new Mr. Coffee machines showed up at my frat house? Mm -hmm. Not one, five. We had, we had them strategically placed throughout the entire house. It was a simple prayer. None of these people knew each other. Some of them weren't even the church. That, that, I mean, they just showed, heard you, heard you. Heard you had a, a, a disaster that you were out of coffee. It, by the way, here, here's, here's a two-pound can of Maxwell. <clears throat> God answers even the simple prayers. The group of us started to take prayer seriously. Richie, it was one of those, there was the, the first floor apartment which I was in, and then the second and third floors were single rooms with a bathroom in the hallway type, you know, down the hall type thing. Typical frat house. Well, Richie and my buddy Dave were roommates. They each had a room, but you had to go through Dave's room to get to Richie's room. So we always called it the back room. That's where Richie, Rich, Richie was a, uh, a grad student. And he was our fearless leader. Because he was a grad student, he was three, four years older than us. He had been saved for qu quite a while. He was into the navigators. He was seriously into memorizing scripture. Great guy if you're a new believer to have in your life. Well, we'd get into his room every single night, 8 o'clock, midnight, whatever, and we would get together and pray. We cultivated a list of over 400 names of people that we were praying, guys from our high school experience, our family members. We prayed. Now, our little college group of college-age adults, the church that was going, 8 to 12 joy kids, about when I started-ish. Yeah. yeah. Do you know in five months there were 220 of us? Most of us got saved through the, the little core group of the four of us because we just had chutzpah. We were like, have you met Jesus? You know, we were just that. We were annoying. We'd wear you down. We would, we, would, we would have a volleyball thing on Friday nights. You know, we'd grill some hot dogs, have some Pepsi, and we'd play volleyball. And there would be like 40 people on a side. It was hilarious, you know? But, you know, 35 years later, with the invention of Facebook, I started to reach out to people I hadn't seen for 30-some years. And you know what? I discovered that some of the guys and gals on that prayer list, some of my exes, some of my buddies, a couple of my enemies mm -hmm. got saved. They're about the same time we were praying in that two-year window. Oh, yeah, it was 1978. I, I, you know, some guys came into my life on campus down in, down in Mississippi, you know, or I was working the docks in 1977, and, you know, I don't know what about just some people came into my life and they started witnessing to me. And listen, the power, the fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous person avails much. There are people that are in heaven that are serving in ministry because somebody prayed. Fast forward a few years. I'm married. The joy of my life. So convenient that her name is Joy. It so fits. You know, she is the, I have joy around about me. You know, I just, it's silly little puns, but uh, back in the day, people would giggle and laugh, and I, not so much anymore. I guess I'm just old and tired. Anyway, um, the two of us became small group leaders in our church. Every Wednesday night, we would gather in our house, and we started out with a couple widow ladies and a lady with her kids who was a church widow because her husband wanted to know nothing to do with church. And that was our 
small group. That group eventually grew over four years and split and divided like th three times. Uh, we grew to 30 some people. Uh, in that group, we had a, a, a widow lady named Martha. Love Martha. She was, uh, she was Puerto Rican. She introduced me to plantains. Plantains are good. <laughs> anyway, uh, we would have a snack time and she would bring stuff. Our, our, our snack time looked international because we had so many international people in the room. We, we had, it was a variety, it was cool. Anyway, she invited Joy and I to our house for Sunday dinner after church. And unless be knowing to us, she invited her son who was, and wife who, he was a Delaware State Trooper. He dwarfed me. He was huge. And when we got to the pre-dessert coffee round of a wonderful meal that she cooked for us, she goes, I have a motive for having you here today, Chuck. Joy. You see, my son and his wife have been trying to conceive for the last five years. I'm getting old. I want grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Huh? Nine years. Nine years? Thank you. I'm glad my wife is in the room. She remembers these little details. <laughs> Please feel free to correct me if I'm out of line. <laughs> uh, so nine years. So I said, well, let's, let's pray. Now, before I talk about praying, I want you to understand something. Joy and I had been, we were, I was about to turn 30. Both of us had tested that neither one of us could ever have children. We wanted kids. We were tired of being dinks, double income, no kids. You know, it was a yuppie thing. We wanted kids. We couldn't have kids. To this day, we can't have kids. But God called upon me to pray for this little grandmama's, this little widow lady's prayer that her barren child would have a kid. It was either that week or the week after that the doctor called me and said, I'm sorry, Mr. Kiefer, you will never have children. Your parts, your plumbing doesn't work. I'm like, okay, I'm going to pray for these people. And I prayed for these people. And you know what happened 10 months later? They had a kid. God heard her cry, and we prayed for her cry. That time when we were living in Wilmington and being small group leaders was the most formulative leadership exchange that I had ever gone through. I learned so much about being a pastor when I wasn't a pastor. I was just, I was shepherding people. I was discipling people. I was, I was in business. I was working as an exec. I was working long hours. You know, we, we hear somebody who would be out of food. And Jim Tate, who was working for Bell Telephone at the time, AT&T, uh, we'd meet up after work. We go to Pathmark, we buy a couple bags of groceries and get a gift card. We go down to like the really difficult part of Wilmington. We leave two bags and the gift card on the porch because we knew they were home. We rang the doorbell and we'd run like two little ten-year-olds down the street, giggling, hiding behind a bush a block away, look peering around to see them come out to the porch and find the food. I mean, there, there's a joy about what we were going about. We were passionate about his stuff, you know. And we were praying. We were praying it about how do we get ahead? How do we follow his plan? Well, was it, did we pray for a whole year about your job situation? It was a long time. Joy is uh, an artist, gifted writer. And she was working for possibly one of the finest art supply stores in the East Coast. You know, her clients included Jamie Wyatt. I remember we were at dinner one night, she, and she's just shaking her head at the dinner table. I said, what's going on? She goes, Jamie Wyatt came in today, and he wanted to learn a new technique. And he cornered me and asked me how this worked. I'm like, no, 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 you're not understanding. There's something wrong with this picture. You're, I'm supposed to be asking you. No, 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 you, this, this kind of paint. Well, tell me about it. So she wanted to be devoted to her craft, and she wanted to quit her job, and press in on her art. And we had bathed this in prayer, bathed this in prayer, bathed this in prayer. And I was working for a company that was, it was a corporate job. I was in sales and marketing. It was a little cutthroat. You know, 10 people got fired every Friday and 10 new people go on. We had 300 salespeople. You know, it was, it was a bit of a cutthroat thing. You had quotas and you had phone time. And it was, it was high pressure. So we were, I was taking a break and I was talking to her on the phone. And 
we had just finally come to the place where we both had peace. I said, go ahead and give notice. I hung up. Five minutes later, literally five minutes later, I remember this as the day is long. Senior Vice President calls me and says, I want you to come up to my office. I want to meet with you. First of all, nobody went up to his office and came back with a job. It was scary. I'm sweating bullets. I get on the elevator. I go up. I go to I sit down. And he's smiling at me, which makes me even more nervous. I just told my wife to quit her job. He goes, Charlie, I've been watching you for some time, and I really, you've got an amazing potential. I'm like, okay, where's this going? Mm -hmm. We're organizing a new six-person task force. We have a new product coming out that's going to be the, uh, the hallmark of our 100-year-old company, and we want to bring it to profitability. And I'm going to be assigning these six marketing people to product development to bring this from the drawing board to profitability within 18 months. Oh, okay. He goes, no, 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 wait, wait, there's a, I know that you're going to be taking some risks doing this financially. So I want you to know I'm giving you a raise. He hands me an envelope because I want you to open it and look at it. But you know what? I think you're going to love this. I open the letter and it's a handwritten note that my raise was going to be exactly to the penny what she was giving up that morning, a month. Does God provide or does God provide? Now, we agonized at least a year over this, and we finally took the step of faith, and we believed God for it. We did not expect that as a result, you know? God gave us peace. We were pressing in on his desires. We were giving, we were serving, we were passionate about his kingdom and expanding his kingdom. He heard our prayers. Talk about this church for a bit. Our first five years, we're 13 now, Chris? Ish? Yes. There was something that we did, or I did, in the very beginning uh, that we have gotten away from. Missions is one of them. More importantly is prayer walking. Do you know every place that we prayer walk during our first five years, we now have favor, open doors. If we have prayed, we, would, we have had 60, 70 submission teams come and visit with us week at a time or a weekend. Part of every single team that has come in, we have had them go and pray in the neighborhood or pray at a college campus or pray for whatever. Every single place where we have persistently prayed, we have seen open doors. Every single place. If you're not part of our Thursday night group, I encourage you to be part of our Thursday night group because God hears our prayers. I was talking with Gordon a couple weeks ago, one of Gordon's regular prayers is God increase my bookings. You know, he lives with lives on the on the mercy of someone calling and saying, "Would you come speak?" You know, he can mark it all he wants, but he's still at the mercy of someone picking up the phone and saying, "Hey, would you come?" Now, with COVID, it's a little hard for comedians to do what they do because nobody's meeting in buildings, you know let alone do massive fundraising events like pregnancy centers and dinners and that kind of stuff. Well, the other week we were praying that he was talking about this particular month of the year, I think it was November, that he would really like to see two, three more bookings come in for that month so he can eat, you yeah. know. And uh, we prayed and literally, again, I go with five minutes, but like within the first half hour ending prayer meeting, he gets an email saying, hey, would you come and speak? I'll give you full full price and airfare. God answers the persistent, fervent prayer. Got two more quickies, two more areas. I want to talk about healing because we have a lot of broken people, both emotionally, financially, and physically. 
it, being a church and a small church in an area where we do a lot of uh, personal ministry, we come across a lot of people that have dealt with stuff. I'm sitting here as a walking, living, breathing miracle. When I was in for cancer, I barely survived, but I survived the surgery, nine hours or ten hours of surgery. I had multiple bleeds internally afterwards. I had 17 pints of blood pumped into me. I was in a coma for two weeks. I still, my short-term memory has never completely returned. Um, I remember being wheelchaired into, uh, they transported me to see my surgeon. It was probably six weeks after surgery. I was in a separate hospital. Uh, they, they wanted me to do my follow-up with him. So I'm in a wheelchair. We get there. Um, wheelchair will go through the door into the lobby, but it won't go into the room. I had not learned to walk again. I was barely able to stand, but I was able to stand and drag myself with the help of two attendants, the two guys from the Amless Corps, to get me to a chair. And I'm sitting there, I'm in pain. And my surgeon comes in, he sits down, he doesn't look me in the eye. Great doctor, but he wouldn't look me in the eye. He said, Mr. Kiefer, I. I never expected to have this conversation with you. For all intents and purposes, you should not be here. He's not looking at me. He's just talking to me. He's talking about what I went through and what I experienced. He goes, call it a miracle. You shouldn't be here. There was a point in time in my, my post-surgery that my blood pressure was down to 42 over 22. They couldn't get IVs in me. I had a guy named Dennis who I've yet to meet, but God bless him. He has an amazing reputation from Crozier that I've heard. He worked multiple hours to get an IV into me so that I would live that, that first night. My buddy was here, hung out with my wife during my surgery. He went back to the state convention was going on. And the night where I was as good as dead, where the doctors are saying, Mrs. Kiefer, just walk away and leave him go, um, she texted Robert at the state convention. And over 300 churches stopped the business of the state convention and prayed for me. I want you to know that God heard their cry and I lived that night. Two, after two weeks and coming out of the coma, this, the induced coma, I remember my nurse being Muslim because I remember the burqa that she was wearing. She goes, ah, oh, Mr. Kiefer, you're with us again. Or should I call you Reverend? Mm -hmm. I've been dead to the world for two weeks and they still know I'm a pastor. What is with that, you know? Mm -hmm. How can I, can I just be incognito, you know? She goes, we're looking around to get some praise and worship tapes for you to listen to because we know we'll encourage you. Do you need a Bible? Do you need somebody to read to you? She was Muslim. And she said this to me. I don't know why I'm saying this, but God's not done with you yet. That became the phrase that everybody that visited me, whether they were from the campground that we were a part of, or the church, or somebody that I used to work with, or a doctor, it was 90 some days of every day, somebody telling me, God's not done with you yet. Do you know that got me through learning how to walk again? That got me through physical therapy, that got me through so much. I knew that some of you were praying for me because I could feel it. I knew that I learned months later what happened at the state convention. And according to my wife, they didn't do it once, but they did it twice. Stopped and prayed for me. God hears our cry. He cares about every little thing. Last, last 
type of prayer. Generational. I was in a tube recently for a, uh, a chemical stress test of my heart. And uh, my back has not been quite cooperative since. Generational prayer, Psalm 145. Every day I will bless you. Land praise your name for, uh, and praise your name forever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. And his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and upon your glory, your wondrous works, I will meditate. And they shall speak the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. Gordon preached a message a few months ago about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. About it's our mission as a church to pass the torch. Scripture makes that clear. When I was a young believer, I knew nothing about my family. I didn't know we were Spanish. I did not know we were French. Although I had suspicions when I had a teacher one time saying, you're not German. Your, your name is, last name is spelled in the, French, in, the, in the French manner, which really wigged out my dad. But recent years, I've had a DNA test. I know that I have... My great-grandfather's grandfather was a French Huguenot who came to America during the Revolutionary War. I know that on my mother's side that they came from the Czech Republic and landed in Bohemian, Maryland. And I go back nine generations on that side, and they were involved in church. I know that I had great-grandparents. Great-great, well, my great-grandfather's parents and his brothers were itinerant preachers on horseback. They would go start churches and ride, ride. they would be farmers, but then on the weekends they would go ride their horses and, and preach in churches. I know that my great-grandfather walked away from the faith, wanted nothing to do with, he was an embarrassment, he was drunk. Um, still had 17 kids, but left my great-grand great-grandmother to raise them all. There was that black hole in my family that I couldn't get beyond that nobody wanted to talk about except for in hushed tones. Well, I discovered that his grandfather owned a tavern in Lancaster and when he passed in 1810, left $10,000 to start a seminary, which became Lancaster Theological Seminary. He and a bunch of other people put up money for it. And his prayer was that God would raise up generations to go and share the gospel. Here I am, what, 200 years later, I was an answer to that prayer. Because as a teenager, I came to Christ in college. I became a missionary. I became a preacher as an answer to my great-grandfather's grandfather's prayer. We pray this prayer on a regular basis that In Exodus 3, 6, it says, I am the God of your father, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob. God loves the generations and prefers to work within its framework. Who are you praying for now that will come to Christ down the road? Who are you now that somebody prayed for 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, that you are where you are exactly with who you are, that you came to Christ and now you're answering God's call? I want to challenge you that if we are to take God's word seriously, we need to pray in the here and the now. We need to pray for here and the future. We need to be taking seriously every little detail because God does. I hope this has encouraged you. God's answered some of my prayers. There are a few things, you know. I didn't get the Jeep Wrangler. I got the Jeep Patriot. You know, God... God got me a Jeep. wasn't quite the one I wanted, but I'm, I'm very grateful that I got it, you know. Yeah. But, you know, I have a loving wife who's been with me for 40-some years. 
The jokes have stopped, by the way. It used to be when we were married 15, 20 years. Oh, married to the same woman? No, I have been married four times. It's collective. It's uh, cumulative. You know, no, I've been married, you know. I got socks older than some of you. Um, God will answer your prayers. But are you pressing in to know his will? Are you humbling yourself in his presence? Are you fervent about your prayer life and what God's called you to pray for? Are you diligent about the things that he cares about? If you can say yes to those things, and you're faithful in those things, God will give you justice. He will quickly sometimes answer your prayers. And sometimes it will be a little work, but he'll answer your prayers. Amen? Amen? Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for so great a salvation. Use this to edify and encourage us. Use this to draw us closer to a relationship with you. Just have your way now in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.